everybody good afternoon so as margaret just mentioned we are really lucky to get to start off the afternoon with three rock stars in the energy arena and the fun thing is that the three of you all come at this from such totally different angles um i thought we would start by letting each of you explain a little bit more just so everybody has a little bit more of a picture of what it is you do what you're working on right now and then we're going to kick around some big ideas together. Ready? All right. So, Meredith, let me start with you, because we've already been introduced to you. And because your work is maybe the easiest for me, at least, to wrap my head around. The idea is you are going to rid us, hallelujah, of the dreaded power cord. And the way this is going to work, let me see if I can explain it, is you have, it's like foot, one foot by one foot flat squares that will go up on a wall and be continually beaming power to our phones, our laptops, whatever device we want. I got it right? Done part. OK. Um, I mean, <laughs> you have the gist right, but um, we have not released the specs yet, so I got a little nervous when we said one foot by one foot. But, um, but we're talking not minute and not the entire wall. Yeah, no, it's, okay. it's like a flat panel speaker. OK. Um, and uh, we can make them all different shapes, sizes, colors. We can form the complex curves and uh, a bunch of things. And this is ultrasound, is that the way it works? Yeah, when it's so um, we have two parts to the system. We have a transmitter, um, which you can think about like a speaker, except instead of emitting audible sound, we emit um, high frequency sound called ultrasound. And um, we beam that energy through the air. It hits a receiver, which you can think about like a microphone. Um, and we vibrate that uh, rec receiver at a frequency through fast through the field, and we convert that vibration into electricity, and it charges your device. So I was at Dulles Airport trying to get out here this morning. I nearly got into a fist fight with another woman <laughs> who was battling me for what I think was the very last power jack on Terminal C. So I will abandon all pretense of journalistic neutrality here and say I am cheering your every effort. When can we get one? I'm sure this is the question everybody asks yeah. you. Well, we do predict that the crime rate will actually go down with you being Really? Um, we'll stop clubbing each other absolutely. over power jacks? Okay. Um, or strangling each other in frustration? Yeah. So within the next uh, 18 months, uh, we'll be launching in a city near you. Uh -huh. <laughs> Can you give us any more clues? A California city? A city that we're in right now? <laughs> <laughs> and the 30-second version of what needs to be done in that 18 months, what are you still working on? Um, scaling manufacturers. Make it smaller? Oh, no. Um, making lots of them. Making and them. and um, uh, optimizing our manufacturing process. All right. Kate, you next. Your work is a little bit more abstract and wide-ranging at IDEO. And I know you've brought a couple of slides, so let me hand it over to you and tell us in a nutshell, what do you do every day? Sure. Well, at, at IDEO, we're a design and innovation consultancy. And I would say that in our work in the energy space, as in our work across the other sectors and industries that we work in, um, what we're doing is bringing a human-centered lens to the given challenge. So, um, you know, in the, in the energy space, I think that's really about, you know, how can we create meaningful connections between people and their energy? I think the, the big issue in this space is really that energy essentially is abstract to most people. Um, you know, it's, you can't see it, it's cheap, um, and you don't really, pay, you know, you don't have to pay for it till after. Um, so it's not like a pay at the pump kind of situation. Um, so what we often look at, and I'll share a couple of examples, is ways that um, we can actually tie the use of energy to what it actually enables and make it about um, you know, the moments where it matters in people's lives and where they're actually thinking about, um, they're thinking about energy in their own routines. Um, so you know, as an example, I think it's really easy to, in the energy space, jump quickly to technologies. But actually, this is an example of work that we did with the Department of Energy around specifically those moments that matter um, and getting prompts for how you can change things like you know, lowering the shades or um, you know, adjusting the orientation um, of a building before you've built it, or in this case, you know, painting the, the surface of a roof in order to save energy. So it's kind of getting the prompt in there right when you're thinking about planning for your day in terms of you know, looking at the weather. Um, and this is, I think, a, a really nice example. This is a, an example of work that we did with a utility in Michigan. Um, and what you see here is you know, not just being able to access your account on your mobile device, but also being able on the far right to see um, like when there's an outage, it actually asks you, you know, like, is your power on or off? And you can get a sense in a dynamic map of 
kind of the outlines of that power outage. So again, you're, you're able to see how it matters to you and how it's affecting people around you. Um, and just one more quick example. Um, this was actually a nice project that we launched last year. And what it does is it's, it's actually the LEED plaque. I think probably most of you guys are familiar with the LEED program. Um, you know, it's a certification program for buildings that conform to um, a pretty stringent set of energy standards. And the plaque previously was just that, a plaque to say this building was built to this set of standards. Um, but it actually didn't tell you anything about the energy use in the building um, once it was built, so the ways that people were using energy. So what this, this um, dynamic lead plaque enables people to actually see the ways that their behavior um, is actually affecting um, the energy kind of footprint of the building in use um, rather than in construction. Is it interactive? Can you it is, yeah. input information if you work in that building and exactly. you think something could work better? Exactly, and then you can kind of see the impact of your decisions and those of your coworkers around you. Yeah. Okay, and Elon, I'm saving you, not, not uh, last but not least, you come at this from an academic perspective, you're based up at Berkeley, you're, for purposes of this panel, we'll call you the money guy. Um, you have been a co-founder at Cyclotron Road, which helps give seed money to brilliant young scientists to grow their ideas before they're ready to, to go out and face the, the big bad world of, of venture capital. Is that, is that a basic description of what you're doing? Yes. Yeah, so okay. Cyclotron Road is, a, is essentially a new seed funding and technology incubation platform okay. uh, specifically for energy technologies and specifically for ones which would be very hard to develop in any other environment. Um, we support technologies that are what we like to call hard technologies, uh, really hard technology development, hard science, so you know, physics, materials, chemistry, hardware, um, and where disruptive market changes are needed specifically for industries which are very hard to disrupt, um, like most of the energy sector. And is that why, I mean, if I'm a brilliant young scientist and I have a great idea, what's holding me back from just going straight out and pitching for funding? Is, is it this idea that certain things are, certain industries harder to disrupt, certain things are going to take longer to turn around and be profitable? Yeah, so yeah. I'll make a confession. Uh, you know, when I saw the topic for the event, <laughs> you know, Generation Unplugged and Millennials, the first thing I did was went to Wikipedia and tried to remind myself what actually are the traits of millennials, only to realize <laughs> that I think I'm an edge case millennial myself. <laughs> um, and I, maybe that's why I was invited. Millennial to veering show. toward Gen X. Um, <laughs> But you know, and I don't, I don't love the, the blanket categorizations as a scientist. But some, you know, some things didn't quite resonate with me. Some things did, and resonated pretty strongly about what we're doing right now, which is, you know, sort of a, a trend, I think, against sort of dependence on and a connection to the institution, right? Whether that's you know a big, you know, going to take the big corporate job as an example, it sort of makes sense, right? We we feel like. Information has been democratized, infrastructure has been democratized, networks have been democratized. You know, I think historically you would go to big companies because they had the infrastructure and the knowledge and the networks right. to get what you wanted to get done. And I think a lot of people today feel like, well, no, I can get knowledge and networks and infrastructure on the cloud, whatever else, very simply. Uh, so what do you do? You, you know, drop out of your favorite university uh, and you go off and you create a, a company um, maybe like the one that Meredith is creating. Um, but what we've found is that there is a very good infrastructure and ecosystem set up. It's an easy path to take, not an easy path to take, but it's an acceptable path to take if you actually are working on something that doesn't require that infrastructure. Um, and so, you know, three folks in an idea, sit in the basement, code, test it out in the marketplace, you can go back and code, pretty straightforward. If you're trying to develop something like a next generation heat engine technology, um, it turns out you do need some phenomenal resources. Right. Uh, and what we found was uh, a lot of folks who had the technical ability to go develop those innovative solutions didn't really know where the right place to go to do it was. Um, you know, going to venture capitalists today, it's not clear you can get the amount of capital the amount of time and support you need. Uh, and so what we've done is created essentially a program that is a home for those types of innovators. The program is embedded at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, which is an 800- Has the resources. Yeah, yep. a million dollar a year facility. 
with phenomenal scientists, but also things like electron microscopes um, and you know the types of tools you need to develop physical systems. Meredith, you were saying right before we walked out, you wished he'd been around doing this in 2012 when you were trying to raise capital to get off the ground. That's right. Yeah, there, uh, <laughs> there was maybe one hardware incubator or something like that when when I started, and I think I even maybe applied to like Y Combinator or something. But I was like, at the end of the day, you know, my network of uh, physicists is probably not going to be here. Um, yeah, and tools are expensive, so you know, had I been around something like that, that might have been helpful. Wait, I mean, let's stick with the money theme for a minute, and I'll and I'll throw this at you, Kate. When you see some spectacular new idea, and you want to figure out how do I make this successful, how do I get people talking about it and involved in it, are the bigger is the bigger obstacle is it is it funding? Is it the technology? Like, what what hurdles are are you trying to leap over as as you look at down the road? Well, at IDEO, I would say we're typically working with folks on bringing an idea to market. Right. Um, and whether that's, you know, that, that could be a product, a tool, a system, an organization, or the organization behind that. Um, so I think, I think what we're often doing is saying, like, if we're able to work with you to identify through human-centered research a really compelling use case um, and that, you know, X fulfills um, unmet needs and desires in the market, so that you're then able to size that market and be able to um, secure potential, or ideally, the funding to actually bring it. And when it. you say human-centered research, that means what? Going out and just asking people, how are you using this? How could it work better? It means, yeah, I, I would. It means a pretty structured process of understanding users' needs, which does include like in-depth interviews with people, often in their homes, sometimes shadowing them, really understanding often in the case of energy use, kind of understanding the entire pattern of their day. You know, where are they actually, um, you know, how, how, does, how, do, how do their patterns of energy use, you know, reflect um, their priorities, their values? Um, you know, what kind of workarounds are they, are they using in order to um, kind of get what they need? Yeah. Um, and what are the opportunities to design um, products, tools, services um, in a better way? Um, you three are all at something of a sweet spot. Um, I'll grant you honorary millennial status and say you're all at a point where you you are far enough along in your careers, even at age 25, you might be the youngest up here, to have some experience, to kind of know what you're doing, to be able to articulate it, and yet young enough to have the energy to do it. And I wonder, as you found, worked your way along in your careers, how much do you find it's one thing to have a great idea, it's another thing to sell it, to be able to articulate it, you know, both to potential funders, but to people you're trying to hire, to people you're trying to convince to cover it, write about it in the papers, you know, how much, how did you go about figuring out how to explain what you're doing to a wider audience? I'll, I'll just, I mean, I'll, I'll speak for our process at IDEO. Um, I think we believe that storytelling is a huge part of um, talking about ideas, of concepts, of kind of the future of almost anything, um, and actually expressing expressing a narrative and expressing an idea in a way that people can relate to and see yeah. themselves in, is a huge part of almost every project that we do. Um, especially, in, I would say, especially in the energy space, where again, like the the use of energy is quite abstract and a little bit removed from people's kind of um, everyday moments. Meredith, was it a learning process for you? Uh, to learn how to explain, yeah, I think. Um, not really, because that's actually the way that I um, yeah. understand the uh, science in general. You know, I break things down um, to a level that um, anyone can relate to, or at least I try to, and that's how I go about understanding things. So it's like, okay, well, how does sound work? You know, well, it's sort of like programmed wind through the air. You know, just breaking it down mm -hmm. to something that you know that somebody else understands, um, then things become interesting. Um, so I think, uh, like what you said, storytelling is a really important part of the story. Um, you know, that's what could make one person drink a cup of coffee versus another one, right. um, even if they taste the same. You know, how do you engage uh, people to not become, uh, to become interested in, um, in what you're doing? And then, you know, that helps the business, it helps, uh, I mean, it, it helps the world in general. And when you're dealing with uh, pretty complicated topics like energy um, that I would say most of the world would probably snore at, um, it creates a connection with users. Right. Yeah. yeah. I want to do a quick lightning round, and I'll start with you. What's the coolest idea 
if I if I walked into your shop this week, what would you say? Oh my God, you got to talk to this guy. It's, he's working on the greatest thing ever. It's going to change the world. What is it? Well, I think I think if you walked into our shop, the thing you would the coolest thing you would come away from is the idea of holy cow, there there are these phenomenally talented technologists who could be developing the solutions for the future, and they, without programs like this, wouldn't have a place to do it, is just sort of a shock. Uh, the example that I'll give, uh, we have two electric chemists okay. leading a project um, in our program, uh, one named Kendra Cool, the other at Tasha Cave, came out of Stanford, uh, and their dream and what they've worked on through their PhDs and now in the program is to essentially develop a, an electrochemical technology. So electrochemical, take electricity in, largely from renewable energy sources. Um, chemical, you know, use it to drive some chemical reactions, and the chemical reaction they'd like to drive is turning essentially CO2 into wa and water into uh, transportation fuels. So. Transportation fuels to power a car, plane, sure. train, anything. Would, yeah, if exactly. it moves, it could let's, be let's say car. Okay. okay. Um, and so if you just think about that for a second, you say, okay, renewable electricity and CO2 give you fuel, which then <coughs> produces CO2, but then you take up that CO2 for the next process, right? So you are closing the cycle there. Phenomenally, phenomenally <coughs> challenging technology. Um, the physics works, but phenomenally challenging. And um, they just need the time and the support to give it a shot. And, Quick follow up on that, and then I want to hear what the coolest thing you is that's on y'all's radar too. But quick follow up, which is just you know we're talking here about renewable energy, fresh ways of thinking about energy. How big of a bummer is it that gas prices are so low? I mean, are you seeing interest flagging in renewable en in energy, given that plain old fashioned fashion fossil fuels are are dirt cheap right now? Funding same lower. I'll I mean I'll. Um, not to address the funding side of that, but I think there's an opportunity there that um, connects to, I think, other patterns we're seeing, um, as, as I would say particularly with millennials, and that is kind of this, um, the interest in authenticity that we see with the way that we um, eat and the way that, you know, the kind of idea of um, really caring about the origins of our food and our food system, and that's, I think, we're already seeing that transfer into, like, the origins of our clothing. Um, you know where things made, um, and I think that I think that idea that where things come from is something that matters to people feels like it's on the cusp of kind of gathering more momentum. I mean, there's a little bit of it, but but in the energy space too. Um, and I think one of the things is being able to tell that story in a more compelling way, also. But being able to say like, or making the connection between you know like my you know my car, my house, etc are running on energy that I know where it comes from, that isn't coal-based, that is renewable, et cetera, um, I think is, is one of the things that I see as really exciting. Oh, that's the, really interesting. Um, and you're talking, phase. I mean, give us yeah. an example. Are you talking about solar power? I care that this is, this is harvested from the sun over I don't think it nece what? necessarily matters, but okay. whether it's, yeah, whether it's, you know, different kinds of fuel, solar power, um, I think it's more about just kind of connecting the story of you know, authentic origins of my, you know, whether it's like food, clothing, power, um, and sort of seeing that as a reflection of, um, you know, a consumer's values. So we're soon um, going to drive up to the pump and be filling our car and it'll say, you know, gas from good old US of A instead of imported from wherever. Or it won't be, yeah, it might there. not be gas, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Meredith, coolest idea that's crossed your radar in the last month? Well, I'm probably not exposed. Aside to from your own, I'm probably not exposed to too many outside ideas, um, <laughs> like you guys are. Because my, my head is yeah. with good reason. Stuff. Um, but uh, I would say at, um, Danielle Fong's technology, who, uh, she's who we'll hear from later here, this afternoon. Um, uh, her really unique energy storage system that she invented is one of the uh, most game-changing uh, inventions in energy that I've come across. But this is I've known about it for a little bit longer. Than We'll be talking to Danielle this afternoon, and her idea is compressed air. It's great to have solar power, but it's not so great when the sun goes down. You can't use it, so how do you store it? And she's got a really interesting novel technology to... And also transatomic power. You should get that out, too. Okay, there you go. What, I mean, we're, we're talking about millennials this morning, uh, this afternoon, and I'm wondering, I'm on East Coast time, forgive me, I don't know <laughs> what time zone we're in. I just came in from Dulles, as I say. I, you know, how, how are... 
your generation, 20 30 somethings, 30 somethings, changing expectations about energy. I mean, you and the way it's used. You were just mentioning, for example, maybe we'll be at a point in a, in a year, a few years' time, where people care more about where their energy is sourced. What else like that that we see in this generation of people? How's it changing the way people use energy? Or think about it. Elon? Uh, I, you know, I think one of the things that comes to mind, one of the things I was reading on, on millennials was, was essentially <laughs> the idea that, um, that there's, uh, sorry, uh, this apparently if I'm a On your deep <laughs> archaeological <laughs> dig. Exactly. Back to your, um, back to your take a scientific years. approach to millennials. Yeah, no, I, I, think, I think this struggle between, um, you know, is, is capitalism the strong agent for change or socialism? Uh, and I think that's going to come to a head around energy. Uh, what, one thing I have seen is I think my, our generation of, of innovators I think has been very much in the mindset of you know the way you change the world in this arena is you develop a technology, uh -huh. leverage market forces, get it out into widespread deployment and change the world. Um, but to your point around low gas prices, um, you know at some point that's you know we need to do that, uh, but there's obviously, you know, other aspects to solving this problem, and I think that's going to be a struggle. Hmm. Does it matter in this very connected world where you work from? Meredith, I'll throw this question to you because you chose not to base yourself in San Francisco, to, but to go to LA. Um, why? Um, well, a couple things. One, um, even though LA is pretty known for the entertainment industry, uh, the other industry that it could be known for is also, you know, aerospace um, and hardware. Mm -hmm. And so, a lot of our engineers are electrical or acoustic or aerospace or et cetera engineers. We're actually down there. Um, so that's one reason. The other other reason is that we're two blocks from the beach and it's 70 degrees every day. We are all very <laughs> happy. So, this is hard to argue with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's also cheaper than the city. And quickly, you two, could you do your work somewhere else? Could you be in New York? Could you be in Delhi? Speaking for, I mean, IDEO has 10 offices around the world, and we actually do work out of our yeah. other offices pretty frequently. Um, we travel a lot for research to, as I said, understand consumer needs depending on, you know, what challenge and market we're focusing on. Um, and I, mean, I think we find, so I would say out of IDEO, 650 people, probably, probably about close to 25, 30% are on the road and traveling at any given time. Um, and I would guess that many of those are also stopping by another office um, somewhere around the world and either working from there or checking in with other teams from there or connecting with people, um, connecting with colleagues. So you're um, road warriors. How about you, Elon? Uh, well, our program is sort of meant to attract the sort of best, most passionate, most qualified innovators. Um, the Bay Area is one of the places those people want to go. Uh, that's helpful. Uh, we're also lucky enough that one of the phenomenal network of national laboratories that the U.S. government runs uh, sits at Berkeley right. um, and essentially can be a host for people who want to transform sort of physical systems in the physical world. Um, and so if you want institutional <coughs> resources, you need to have the institution to that's right. support it. Uh, and this is an institution that, that part, you know, part of the core of its mission is Transform the landscape for how energy works. So, uh, you know, that's that's a pretty nice, perfect storm. Um, we'd like to see whether what we can do can be transferred either to other research institutions or other geographies. Got it. Let me throw it open to questions. Um, if we've got microphones coming around, so if you have a question, raise your hand. We'll bring a microphone to you and state your name. And uh, please try to actually ask a question. That would be great. Mm -hmm. I probably don't need this. <laughs> Meredith, on your website, you show a lot of products, not just the flat screen and charger. Can you talk a little bit about, I've seen other products, for other applications, but there's like so many dishes on it. Are, are there other products that you're making? Um, so I don't think we've actually addressed what product we are making. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, we're starting with phones, uh, charging phones. But over time, as we uh, increase the number of people in our company and, and uh, in general, just our bandwidth, will, our goal is to be able to charge everything from your hearing aid battery to your flat screen TV um, so that we can eliminate all electrical outlets and wires altogether. And then other things beyond that that I won't bring up. Okay. And the technology is different then for 
charging a cell phone as opposed to charging a hearing aid? No, the same thing. Same it's, technology, it's just, it's just uh, amplifying it? An, a, an additional uh, manufacturing line that we can't handle right now. Okay. All right. Next. Yep, one over here. Um, hi, I have a question, I guess, directed at Elon. I, I think I'm an edge case millennial and I moved here from Australia, so a lot of the things being said resonate with me. Um, and I'm particularly interested in what you said about socialism and capitalism, because I've moved to the Bay Area to find, I guess, uh, incubators like yours and people like the ones you described. But I seem to find a lot of people who are interested in technology for technology's sake, rather than the power for technology to uh, catalyze systemic change if implemented properly. So I'm wondering, yeah, do you, do you feel like there is a critical mass of people who see things in a more than pure technology as a solution kind of way? Thank you. Um, I, part of me wants to answer with just come visit us. Because uh, yeah, I, I do think I do think there is a critical mass, and I think if there's anything that uh, I think if there's anything that the last generation of people trying to solve this problem with technology learned, it was that technology is one piece of it, and the way you know the way you succeed is being smart around how you develop the technology. Number one, <laughs> ideally in a way that's sort of resource efficient and aligned with the funding sources and a pathway that can actually get it out into the market. Um, but also number two, you know, being aware of all the reasons why the technology isn't the thing that's going to make an impact. So, uh, yeah, I'm sad to hear that you know you're not finding those people. And we're going to take one last question, but it occurs to me that it seems we need a definition of millennials up here since we're all on the fence. I don't know if that's because we don't want to admit to it or not. And I will admit to Googling it as well. <laughs> it's like a lot of these things, there's no totally agreed on definition. So I think you, if you think you're a millennial, that's great. You know, if you're, if you're 70 and you're a millennial, I'm with you. But it seems to be it's, it's we're talking roughly 20 and 30 something. So we're talking people. There's a specific age bracket. Yeah, it's but it's, you know, like we're Gen X kicks and stops and Gen Y kicks in, Gen Y being millennials, you, you, can, you can debate where around that 1980 birth date, uh, birth date kicks in. We've got room for one more, uh, this gentleman right here. Thanks. Um, yeah, maybe I'm uh, too old to understand this, but why do we need <laughs> wireless charging? Uh, seriously, I mean, we have wall outlets in wiring that work just fine, and why would we want to invest in an entirely new infrastructure to replicate something that already exists? So, um, do you like your Ethernet cable? No. Okay. Um, if you still use your Ethernet cable today, do you think that you would want Wi-Fi, or do you think that you know it would be oh, a waste I, of time? Oh, I love Wi-Fi, but the challenges of propagating information through radio signals seems uh, order of magnitude less than the challenge of propagating power through the air. Well, it's all complex, and there are all waves. Um, but you know. There's a lot of different reasons why we might want wireless power. Uh, for example, um, you know, aside from just being able to charge our phones, uh, there's things like uh, having to replace your uh, pacemaker battery every seven years surgically. Um, and you know, people with pacemakers are generally older, and um, any kind of operation like that is uh, takes a real toll on people. So if you could just, you know, put a charger right up against your chest and. Mm -hmm charge it instead of having to go through a huge procedure, wouldn't that be better? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so that's one example. All right, we're gonna have to leave it there. Thank you all so much. Mm -hmm. Kate, Meredith, Elon, thank you for joining me. Thanks everybody. Thank you for having us. Right this way. <laughs>